I remember the day my dad brought home an IBM computer. He was incredibly excited. Think kid in a candy store. He was poised to pick up the PC the very minute the doors were unlocked and leapt from the car. In his euphoria, he didn't notice the parking curb, tripped and hit his head on a wall. As he later described the scene, he brushed himself off and, failing to notice the gash on his head, walked into the computer store. <laughs> the salesman must have been aghast at his condition and strongly suggested my father needed medical attention, reassuring him that since the store had just opened, there would be plenty of time to pick up a, the computer after seeing a doctor. It was a Saturday, so my father took himself to the emergency room. A few well-placed bandages later, he at last had the computer in his eager hands. When my mother and I returned home, we were surprised to find him happily exploring the possibilities of his new toy, so engrossed that he was still wearing his blood-stained shirt. <laughs> he dismissed his injuries while gleefully explaining what the computer could do. Forty years before, during the Manhattan Project, a computer was a person who computed. My father was in charge of a, a group of computers, actually mainly young women, and he instructed them each to perform uh, an arithmetic operation on a mechanical desk calculator and to pass the result to the next person, and so on, to get the answer. He likened it to a Henry Ford assembly line, only for numbers. Later, Los Alamos acquired mechanical tabulating machines that could use primitive punch cards to replace each human computer, and my father oversaw that too. So, in a sense, he was a programmer before there were computers as we know them today. In 1975, he played with his Commodore PET computer. Anyone remember those with the tape drive? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and by 1980, he had pioneered quantum computing theory, many years before anyone even imagined it was possible. In my efforts to find what is common between my father and Bill Gates, um, the overlapping circles of a Venn diagram of, of what some people have called the smartest man in the world and the most generous man in the world, I discovered some similarities. They both had sisters nine years younger. Perhaps not completely revealing, <laughs> but as a younger sister myself, I like to think this is relevant. <laughs> they had an unquenchable thirst for learning, devouring encyclopedias and solving puzzles. They were leaders at a young age. Bill Gates was head of Microsoft at 24. At age 24, my father was a leader on the Manhattan Project. They were effective communicators with a similar style, believing that a complex idea should be communicated simply. I think we can agree they were both prescient. They were both unafraid to ask stupid questions, and they both question conventional wisdom and ask for evidence that it is true. My father had a quote on his blackboard when he died, stating, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Bill Gates considers my father the best teacher he's never had. I like to think of the two men as running the same race, and my father is handing the baton to Bill Gates. We've come from punch card computers some 74 years ago to quantum computers, and now Caltech and Bill Gates are making his dreams a reality. Mr. Gates couldn't join us for the celebration this evening, but has prepared a video. I'll give you some background on his efforts to support and preserve my father's legacy. In 1964, my father gave a series of lectures at Cornell University to an audience of, of students who wanted to learn more about the character of physical law. Bill Gates discovered the talks in the 80s when they were not readily available and enjoyed them. Now, he hosts the lectures on a Microsoft website called Project Tuva. It's named after a country in the middle of Russia that my father famously wanted to visit before he died. Unfortunately, he was unable to realize his dream, but showed us all that it was the journey that was important, not the destination.
from a 2009 article in Xconomy discussing how Microsoft's spin on Feynman could change the way we learn. What makes Microsoft Research's new Project Tuva website so wonderful is not just that it puts some of Feynman's most famous physics lectures online, but that it invites the viewers to, to explore the subject matter in exactly the way Feynman would have recommended. The Caltech scientist was famous in part for his lucid way of describing gravity and quantum mechanics. So the lectures certainly stand on their own as educational set pieces. But the transcripts, note-taking tools, and multimedia extras that now stand alongside the videos make the material even more entertaining, accessible, and, well, explorable. My family and I are grateful to Bill Gates for supporting my father's legacy so that future generations may explore these lectures for themselves. And now, Bill Gates. Richard Feynman was an incredible scientist. He spent most of his time at Caltech. The idea of quantum physics, where all these particles are interacting in mysterious ways, he came up with a thing called Feynman diagrams that he won the Nobel Prize for. Perhaps even more importantly, he was an amazing teacher. He did a series of lectures which were for people who didn't specialize in physics. It's such a great example of how he could explain things in a fun and interesting way to anyone, and he was very funny. Incidentally, at the time of uh, Kepler, the problem of what drove the planets around the sun was answered in certain, certain, by some people by saying that there were angels behind here beating their wings and pushing the planet along around orbit. As we'll see that that answer is not very far from the truth, the only difference is that the angels sit in a different direction and the wings go in. Dr. Feynman used a tough process on himself where if he didn't really understand something, he would push himself. Do I understand this boundary case? Do I understand why we don't do it this other way? Do I really understand this? And because he had pushed himself to have such a deep understanding, his ability to take you through the path of the different possibilities was incredible. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon, and if they get it near each other, they snap together. If you can get it faster by heating it up somehow, somewhere, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in. And that gives a lot of jiggly motion, which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms, and they jiggle, and they make mothers jiggle, and you get a terrible catastrophe. That catastrophe is a fire. He's taking something that is a little mysterious to most people and using very simple concepts to explain how it works. He doesn't even tell you he's talking about fire till the very end and you feel like you're kind of figuring it out together with him. Feynman made science so fascinating. He reminded us how much fun it is and everybody can have a pretty full understanding. So he's such a joyful example of you know, how we'd all like to, to learn and think about things. <laughs>